story starts when I actually was in New England. Um, that's where I met Eddie. Um, I, I consider myself an Oklahoman. Um, I, I was born in another part of the world, but I came to the, the US for my college education, came to Oklahoma City, pursued my college degree here and um, settled in Mustang, Oklahoma, where I am now. Um, and everything was going, um, you know, I, I, had, I had my life down. Uh, and then I met my wonderful, amazing, beautiful wife who is uh, from the New York area and she was practicing law in Boston. Um, so I left Oklahoma City in 2014 to come up to New England uh, and build a life there with my spouse uh, in South Hamilton, Massachusetts. Um, and so I lived in South Hamilton for about four years. And after we had our little daughter, who's, uh, who's going to be 21 months old pretty soon, um, when we, once we had her, we knew we needed to be around family. So we relocated back to the Mustang area. So it was in my four-year window in New England that this door kind of opened up uh, because life put me in some uncomfortable situations. I found myself unemployed um, out of nowhere. I had been a uh, speech pathologist for many years, had no troubles finding you know, jobs or whatever, but because of the job market, um, you know, I just found myself unemployed and I, I was circulating my resumes to all these schools and school districts out there in New England and I could not find a job. Well, um, I don't know about you, but pressure has a way of like getting my creative juices flowing. Uh, and so when I found myself unemployed and I, you know, kind of, uh, went through my mind thinking, man, what can I do with all this time that I have on my hands? Uh, that's when the thought occurred to me, you know what, back in college about 10 years ago, um, I had this idea for a story that I wanted to write. And because I had nothing else going on in my day, uh, mind you, if my life was comfortable and I had everything going for me, I don't think my idea would, would have become a book. But because I was uncomfortable and feeling squeezed and pressured by life, I, was, I, I felt the need to do something to feel um, like I was making, you know, making my time, you know, I was, I was making use of my time. And so this little idea that I had in my mind back when I was 18, 19 years old, and, and now I'm about 38, um, I decided to finally take that idea and put it on paper. I had no idea where to start. Um, I have no background in writing. I, I knew that I was not a professional author or anything, but I was like, you know what, I'll start where I am. Uh, and so that's my first piece of encouragement to anyone wanting to get into the schools and, and master your uh, writing journey is start where you are. Uh, whatever stage you are in life, you've got something in your hands. You've got a gift, an idea, a seed that you can sow and start with. So literally living in, sitting in my living room, I, I popped open my laptop and started writing my story, Bello the Cello, um, an idea that I had in my mind when I was 18 years old, a story about a little cello that goes to school and has a hard time fitting in. And at the end of the story, Bello finds his song. Well, if you're asking or wondering, you know, a lot of kiddos ask me, hey, Dennis, uh, or Mr. Matthew, where'd you get the idea for the story? Well, um, it's, it's my story. It's my story. Um, I, I was a misfit growing up in elementary school, middle school. I, I had a hard time fitting in. And uh, believe it or not, at that point in my life in New England, when I was literally typing the words of the story down, I was struggling as a grown man to find my song in that season of life. So there, there was, you know, there were two things happening. I was kind of reflecting back on my childhood, but I was also reflecting back on where I was as a grown up in that point. In that point, and I felt like that's where I was. That's what I was tapping into to write Bello the cello. So on that, I want to say, um, if you are ever wondering as a new author, man, where am I going to go find a good story? I will always encourage you to look at, look back on your own life. Um, I would encourage you and say your own life is the greatest wealth and resource of stories. I mean, like Andrew was sharing, I'm so glad Andrew said that he's right. He, he has written a book or is writing a book about his own life story about his, uh, when he was back in Germany. Did you, did you say Germany, Andrew? Am I, did I remember that correctly? Uh, no, uh, I was born. My family uh, has been from uh, Greece. Salonica, Greece, that's right. Yeah. So, so the idea being, you know, the best stories that you can tell uh, and whether you've lived an adventurous life or what might seem to you as a, as a mundane life, I feel like there's beauty in all of our life stories.
And I feel like the, the, the best place you and I can go and fish for some stories to write books is our own lives. So I would, I would encourage you to be a self-reflective author. A lot of times students will ask me, Mr. Matthew, where do you get your ideas for your stories? And I always, I always say, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a self-reflective author. I always self-reflect on the challenges that I've faced in my own life and how I came to a place of closure through in those challenges. And that's where I go, you know, mine stories, if you will. Um, and so that's where Bello the cello came, came from. And uh, here I was, uh, a guy who knew not, nothing about writing a book but I was, I had started up a word doc and here I am, I'm just typing up Bello the cello. My only goal in that point was not to make the perfect story. It was just to get a beginning, a middle and an end. It was just to put something on a word doc. So, well, I did that. I did that over, over the course of a week. I, I got a beginning, a middle and an end. And then I asked myself, okay, what do I need to do next? Uh, Cause obviously I have no professional training or background in product development, in researching a market. Uh, in, cre in creating wealth, in writing a story, nothing. So I knew being an educator, I knew I needed a writing coach. And so I got on Google and I was like, writing coach. Um, and so sure enough, one of the first links that popped up was a uh, company out of New York called Write by Night. Um, the resource popped up, the link popped up. I didn't know any better. I followed up the link, saw a phone number on that website, took my phone up, gave them a call. Um, and the, uh, ex the uh, chief editor at that writing company answered the, uh, answered the phone. And I was like, hey, uh, this call might, be, might seem random, but I'm calling out of New England. Um, I want to publish a book. What do I do? I need a writing coach. She said, no big deal. I'll uh, connect you with the writing coach. Uh, long story short, that writing coach is now my publisher, my independent publisher, if you will. Um, but he went on, he, he accepted my script, edited it, looked at it. Um, and we ended up publishing Bello the Cello. And that was when, when I actually released Bello the Cello. It was 2018, December. You could even say January 1st, 2019. Well, we are 21 months in. Uh, and by the grace of God, I can say we're coming up on 7,000 copies sold worldwide of Bello the Cello. I've uh, presented Bello the Cello to some 50,000 students or more globally. Um, I do virtual presentations to students all over the world, um, Kenya, the UK, um, the UAE, all over the US. Um, and so that's kind of a, a, a quick snapshot of where I was and where I am now. So now when we're connecting, I'm at a point, I'm at a point in my life where I've got four, um, well, I guess you could say four jobs. I've got my day, daytime job where I'm a public educator, right? But out of this writing bellow, the cello, I'm a full-time author, uh, but three other revenue st streams up, have come out. So I'm an I'm a author that is always writing books. So I'm, I'm, uh, my, my third children's book is going to be coming out, God willing, in the spring. But out of that, because I completely leveraged Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to my advantage, um, I have completely converted all of my social media platforms to focus only on public education, public educators, and things that pertain to public education. So I am not just a children's author now. Um, I'm an advocate for educators. Um, I have, uh, by the grace of God, I've made myself relevant to public educators. I, you know, because I'm a, I'm a public educator myself. So I, I've, I've gone into this with with a very big uh, dream, vision, imagination. I don't pigeonhole myself into someone who just writes books. Um, so once Bello the Cello, uh, um, you're gonna find me rewinding and fast forwarding through my life story and I hope that's okay. Am I boring you guys? Is that, am I, am I doing okay? Am I sharing? All right, all right, cool. And Gail, do you have a question? Yeah, I did. I, you know, I've been, as you've been talking, I've been looking you up on, you know, I've been Googling you and uh, to learn more about your writing. Now, I noticed you have this Mom's Choice Award. I was just looking that that up. So, you know, I see that you've leveraged social media, you've leveraged, um, you know, you've done some very good and, and smart PR for your book. So it's very easy to find you. It's very easy to find your books. You've, you've leveraged credibility through awards. Could you just talk about that? that process being very practical. Yeah. yeah. 
So, you know, I would, I would say there's some front loading of, of work that you and I need to do as authors. Um, I meet a lot of authors that are like, I wrote a book, I put it on Amazon, it's not selling. Um, and I meet a lot of my brothers and sisters in the writing world that expect uh, just because a book is on Amazon and, and nobody knows you, uh, it's not going to sell unless, you know, uh, all, of, all of your stars line up and you have an aha moment and God bless you if that happens, okay? I'm, I'm all for it. But a majority of our stories are, I mean, we're like farmers. We don't see our harvest right away. Uh, we've got to get out front and do a lot of front loading. We got to do a lot of upfront work. And for me, a lot of that work looked like, I looked like a fool the first few months. Um, I mean, it, you know, if anybody had asked me, man, you're not seeing results, you know, what are you doing? I mean, I, you know, I, I would just tell them, oh, it's coming. I just have to invest up front a whole lot. It's kind of like pushing a merry-go-round. If you have 10 kids on a merry-go-round, and I say merry-go-round because there's a playground right here. I'm, I'm sitting in my classroom. So um, if I'm pushing a merry-go-round with 10 kids, those first five rounds, I'm not going to feel a whole lot of momentum, but there's going to be a point where I can just push hard and just let go. And it'll keep spinning and doing the work for me. So that's kind of been my story. So up front, what I did was, uh, Gail, to answer your question, was I got on, on, I got on Facebook and I started locating people who are voices, credible voices in the kid lit world. So for example, um, I mean, I just started scouring Facebook, my personal Facebook page. I did not create a, uh, you know, an author page or nothing. I, I always get requests, Dennis, you create an author page. I'm like, nope. I just want to keep my personal Facebook page and completely convert that to um, my author stuff. So as I was researching through my um, personal Facebook page, I came across a online bookstore out of California called Magic Bean Bookstore. So I'm in New England. I have no influence on the West Coast. I needed somebody to be on the West Coast that would be a mouthpiece for me. So Liat Raguan is my, the Raguan family now, they're my friends, they're my dear friends now. Uh, but Liat Raguan, who's the founder of Magic Bean Bookstore, I reached out to her and I was just like, hey, I messaged her, I was just like, hey, this might seem random, but uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm all, you know, I'm taking risks here. So please forgive me if my messages come coming out of left field, but I, I just wrote a book. Would you like to take a look at it? And she was like, absolutely. I've learned through my journey that 99.99 .99 people out there are very kind, very generous, uh, very welcoming. Um, and uh, it all depends on, are we willing to take a risk? Are we willing to step out of our comfort zones and just ask someone a, a simple question as, I see you're the superintendent of a school district. I see you run mom's choice awards. Will you be able, will you be willing to take a look at my book? And a lot of times that is petrifying to step out of our comfort zones and ask that. But I have yet, I have yet to be disappointed from the, these risks that I've taken. So when I reached out to Liat and I was like, Will you be willing to take a look at Bello the cello? She said, sure, send it my way. I sent her a PDF of it. She looked at, fell in love with it. She was like, you know what? I would love to carry your book on my website. Please do. Brand new author, no sales, nothing. I was like, yeah, please do carry it on Magic Bean Bookstore. But now what, what have I done? I have given my opportunity. This no nothing, brand new author can now with honor and pride say, Magic Bean Bookstore out, out of California carries Bello the cello. Now, I know what I had to do to get to that place, but when the outside world hears it, oh, wow, Magic Bean in California carries Bella the cello, that's how you slowly start creating credibility, right? By taking these little risks behind the scenes. So Liat is well acquainted with Mom's Choice Awards. And she suggested, hey, why don't you submit your book to Mom's Choice Awards? I was like, okay. And you know, you have to, you gotta pay an upfront fee and all that good stuff, but Hey, I'm a farmer. I'm sowing seed for the harvest that's coming. I don't mind putting that risk up front because I see there's something good about my story. Now I've got to be wise about the risks that I take. I mean, I, I speak to first time authors that spend thousands of dollars up front. That's not the kind of risk I'm talking about. I'm talking about well calculated um, risks that are wise, right? Um, so I paid my upfront fee, submitted my PDF for Bello the Cello, Won the Mom's Choice Award, their gold, whatever, their gold seal of approval. There's my second point of credibility. Now, when I promote Bello the Cello to schools, I say, Bello the Cello is a Mom's Choice Award. Bello the Cello is carried by Magic Bean Bookstore. Okay, so I was doing that online work, 
And this is not overnight. It takes months, right? Uh, you just have to be patient. Um, as I was doing that, I started picking up small gigs in the New England area. My first few gigs I would do for free. I wouldn't even charge. Nothing. That's not my long game. But again, I'm trying to become credible. So what would I do? I would go into daycares. I would, you know, like small schools. I would go in and just read. I, I would just, you know, give it everything I've got. And when I would walk out of that presentation, I would say, did you like my presentation? Did you like the book? Oh my gosh, Dennis. Yeah, I love Bello the Cello. And I would ask him, I would love for you to do two things. I would love for you to go to Amazon and put a good review for Bello the Cello. I would also write, like you to write me a recommendation letter that my presentation was good. Guess what started happening? Amazon positive review started accumulating. Reference letters started accumulating. What was I doing? I was getting ready to basically create my uh, inventory or, or my, or my uh, I hate to say this, but my bragging rights, so to speak, for the future. Because I know I would, be, I would be talking, I would have conversations with superintendents in the future. And when you go to a superintendent, you can't just pop out of the blue and say, uh, I wrote a children's book, can you invite me to your school? No, no, no. He needs to see, why do I need to bring you to my district where I've got thousands of students? Well, I've got all these reference letters from educators from all around the country. I've got a hundred plus positive reviews. I was on the uh, brand new releases in Amazon UAE. I'm a, a mom's choice award gold, uh, gold star winner. I'm also a public educator, by the way, right? This is how you create leverage. This is how you create a reason for educators state to say yes to you. So to my authors that are working hard right now, you're that farmer that's sowing seed and not seeing a harvest right now. Keep in mind that the work that you're putting in right now is creating um, unlimited yeses in the future. You are creating your future yeses from people by putting the work in right now. On average, I take about a year to develop a story. A year. I don't rush through my story. I, um, well, thank you, Charlotte. I really appreciate that. I just saw that note on there. Um, so when I develop a story, I always make sure that when someone reads it, they can quickly see themselves in that story. Okay, so make sure your story, whatever story you're writing, I'm a huge fan of writing, looking into your own, I'm a self-reflective author. I would encourage you to look, look into your own life and find a gem that you can develop into a story. But once you develop that story and you put it in front of a classroom, Make sure that children in that classroom can see themselves in your stories. So here's what I mean. Some of the details that only you can make sense out of from your own personal life, those become obstacles and distractors when you put it in front of a classroom. So weed out the details that you think are going to be obstacles in your story for the student in the classroom. Does that make sense, guys? Make, make sure you refine and harness um, what, what matters most in a story. And so to that end, what I'll say is, what I've done to make sure that I, did I see a hand? Did I see a hand? I thought I saw a question. Yes, Charlotte, I had a go ahead. question when you, when you come to a pausing point. Okay, yeah, what I was gonna, well, you know what? I'm, I'm at a pausing point, go ahead. And you may be covering this eventually, but do sure. you have like little kid focus groups and, and things that you try stories out on or? So, you know what? You just gave me an idea. I've never done a kid's focus group. However, I've got a pilot group of teachers. They are, they're sworn to secrecy. <laughs> And they are the ones that always have a front row seat to the evolution of my script from start to finish. Literally this morning, my illustrator from France sent me the first fully rendered spread of my third book and I immediately text messaged it to my librarian uh, to get her feedback on it. Uh, there are many times where I have to you know, this third book that's coming out, it's gone through many changes. I've had to go in and gut it uh, and, and uh, preserve what's, what's cardinal, uh, what's, what's sacred, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, change the periphery, you know, like the, like the outside details. Um, so I, I've got a teacher focus group. And even before my story gets to my editor, listen to this, friends, this is important. Even before my story gets to my professional editor, my story has gone through the ringer with my private teacher focus group. They have been brutally honest with me about my story even before 
my story gets to the editor. And what do they get out of it? I'm sorry to ask so many questions, but I can, no, you're, please, what's please, their please. motivation to invest in your project besides? Well, yeah. So one, these are educators that I have built lifelong relationships with. One. Two, they all get a free signed copy of the book when everything's said and done. Um, three, they get to say, oh, I remember when that book was being created and they get to share that with their children. Um, I am first a public school educator. I am first an educator. That's, that's the lens through which I look at my world. Uh, I love my teachers. When teachers interact with me, they know that I'm not just, they, they are not a means to an end for me. Uh, they understand that Dennis is an advocate for us. So for example, over, over, just to give an example, over the summer when, you know, when all that, when the pandemic was happening, I had just started and um, the racial unrest was going on across the country. Our teachers were having to juggle a lot because they have children from diverse ethnic backgrounds in their classes. Um, also, they were having to do remote learning, distance learning huh. uh, with no lesson plan Right, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, our pre-K teacher, kindergarten teachers, first grade teachers were asked to not enter their buildings. They can't get their, right? And all, but they have the burden of having to teach their students. So here's what I did. Bello had already sold thousands of copies. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna take an active faith here. Through Twitter, through Instagram, through Facebook, I was like, if you need my book PDFs, here's my email, email me. Crazy thing to do. Mm -hmm. But this is how I'm letting my brothers and sisters edu in education know, listen, I am first an, education, an educator and I'm here for you. I got requests from all over the country, from Mexico, from Canada, from China. Guess what? Because the whole world was dealing with it. And I generously gave my PDFs away. What that tells to my core demographic is, man, this is a guy who genuinely cares about us. Now, I'm not trying to be manipulative or selfish or anything, but the organic outcome of that kind of generosity is in the future, right? What I'm creating is I'm creating my future marketplaces. But if I come across as a stingy vendor that only wants to give and take, man, people can smell that. People can smell that from a mile away and they, they don't want to do anything to do with you because teachers have a full plate. Right. So I always reach out to my educators, whether it has nothing, even if it has nothing to do with my books, I always, I always check in with my principals, my superintendents, my teachers and check in with them and say, Hey, how's your week going? How are you doing? I saw your Facebook post. You doing okay. I heard your mom was not feeling, feeling good. Is she, is she better? Like I, so all that to say, build relationships. If you are planning to focus on the school, build relationships, give people a reason to say yes to you. Yes to, um, now, the reason why I liked Gail saying that she was creating a teacher guide is because educators want to know what else you're presenting, not just the story. How can your story fit into my classroom? On that note, I want to say anything that is curriculum friendly, schools will eat up because they're always looking for what can I use in my lesson plans. If you are creating books for schools, I would highly encourage you, you might wanna take this down. Um, I would highly encourage you to create stories that are vocabulary enriching. I would highly encourage you to write stories that uh, create room for critical thinking, conflict resolution. Our babies are dealing with trauma uh, nationwide as we are going through this pandemic. And everything that culture is happening in culture, our, our children are constantly dealing with trauma. Um, if your stories can help these kiddos deal with the trauma in their lives, educators will gladly accept your story. Social emotional learning is a big buzzword right now in education, social emotional learning. Research that up, look up what social emotional learning is. And if you can tie the components of social emotional learning into your story, if you can tie the comp components of uh, tra uh, uh, trauma informed education into your stories, educators will be more willing to look at your story. So all that to say, 
know what the trends in education are. How do you know what the trends in education are? By listening to educators. How do you listen to educators? By having conversations with them. So for me, those conversations started on Facebook land, on Twitter, on Instagram, and by the grace of God, 99.99% of teachers, librarians, principals, superintendents have been very kind, generous, and welcoming because educators need all the help they can in 2020 to reach their children. If your story is going to help a teacher reach a child, you, that, the chances of the teacher saying no are, are, are very unlikely. When I reach out to a school, this is what my MO, does anybody have any questions? I'm gonna pause for a second. Any questions, thoughts, concerns? You need me to shut up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say about the, the uh, releasing things to the you know, world on PDF. I mean, I'm part of a publishing project that is public domain. And we actually encourage people to copy and use and integrate our stuff into it's called Pyragogy and it's about peer learning enterprises. And um, you know, to my knowledge, nobody has really ever not credited us or, you know, like said it that they came up with it. It's you know, we don't care anyway. So hey, Pamela. <laughs> Thank you. So anyway, yeah. I, I I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I, I noticed we only have about 14 minutes left. And um I I've been a publisher for 30 years and I published books on um, Waldorf education and children's literature. I have a annotated list called Make Way for Reading, Great Books for Kindergarten through Grade uh, Eight and a high school reading list. And it's to help adults find the right book for the, right, for the child in their life at the right time. And um, so it's annotated, we vetted. I know that YA, for instance, has gotten lower and lower and lower. So these are all vetted as to what is developmentally um, appropriate. Actually, I'd like to send you a copy of this book. But um, I sell direct to Waldorf schools. Um, my Waldorf Education, a Family Guide, which is an anthology of articles about Waldorf education, I have like 65 authors and for 25 years it has been selling and I finally got out the second edition this summer just as COVID was coming on and budgets are tight and that sort of thing but I've done very well but there are homeschooling families and obviously there's the Waldorf Charter Public School Movement and I have all their names um, but I really want to um, for all my books reach the homeschool market. And I wonder if you can address that or if there are particular sites that I should start having a presence on as a, and, and I'm a former educator myself. I used to teach um, uh, science, biology, and then general science. And I've been a childbirth educator and have taught adults as well. So I've, um, anyway, um, and I'm one of the founders of IPNI. So I'd like to know if you could point me in the direction for the homeschool movement, particularly yeah. since many, many more people are homeschooling. Yeah. So um, I, I'm a big fan of getting to know my own community. And so um, as far as homeschooling is concerned, I am currently in talks with uh, multiple homeschool moms, um, trying to get them to go up the chain of command and talk to their hub leaders um, about, hey, can I do uh, an author event for you? Um, now, so I'm, I'm a, I'm a work-the-grassroots, um, up-the-chain kind of, that's my personal approach um, instead of, I mean, you can do it both ways. I've done a little bit of both, but on the homeschool front, that's what I'm currently doing, talking to my local, like, friends who are homeschool moms, um, specifically going to them and saying, hey, listen, I do all these author visits for, you know, kiddos who are in public schools, I want to create that avenue uh, for you guys. Can you go talk to your hub leader, so to speak? Let's get some homeschooling communities together virtually now. Um, and, you know, and they're excited about it. And those conversations are happening. Um, it's going to be a slow process, obviously. Another thing that I've done here is there's a big virtual charter school community called Epic Schools. Um, I started a conversation with them a year ago. 
Uh, and that's one of those things that I've noticed over the last two years. Um, I have to be very patient um, and follow up, follow up, follow up. Follow. So if there's one thing that I do very well by the grace of God, it's follow up. Um, yeah. I, I sometimes, you know, I follow up with superintendents for a year, if not more, till they give me a big yes. Uh, and so with Epic Schools, for example, and they are primarily in um, Oklahoma, they have thousands of students. Um, and I just had, you know, I started a conversation with one of their teachers about a year ago. And she talked to a teacher who then talked to a teacher who then talked to a teacher. And then I finally last week um, had a conversation with two of their major reading specialists who have a, a big say in um, who they get to bring in as guests and things of that nature. Um, so that's what I do. I kind of get to know my local demographic, my local school community. And I, I try to put plant seeds, if you will, um, you know, with, with people who are in leader, leadership positions. And then I stay in touch with them. Um, one are there thing, particular Facebook groups that are more homeschool oriented or? I have not taken that route because I know there are a billion Facebook groups out there. Um, I, um, I have significant ADHD. <laughs> so, so for my yeah, ADHD yeah. brain, I know I need to focus. Uh, and so for me, it's all about starting small. And then if I end up having a credible movement with the homeschool community, with the Epic uh, virtual charter school community here locally, once I reach credibility, then I'll start putting it online. And then guess what? People, people will seek me out instead mm -hmm. of me having to go like fish in all these different. So that's just kind of what I've done on, on my end. Um, go ahead. Again, Pamela, did you have anything else? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Pam, um, there's a, one that I'm part of for the um, alternative education imprint that it's a uh, Massachusetts homeschoolers connection. And there's there's literally thousands of people, and I just see all the new parents coming on, you know, commenting, you know, what do I do with the this and that, and and a lot of curriculum questions because they don't know, you know. But yeah, there, there's a Massachusetts homeschool connection. Well, I'm lucky that I have a niche and have had mm -hmm. for, you know, yeah, 25, yeah. 30 years, and that I and that I sell uh, direct. I also sell on Amazon. And um, when the um, when the pandemic hit, um, they stopped ordering in April, in May or mid mid March. So for eight weeks, Amazon, uh, there were no orders from Amazon because they were delivering toilet paper <laughs> and paper towels. And uh, but the orders have have come back now, um, and they they are every week and they pay every thirty days. Um, the only problem I've had this summer is with mail, media mail, books not getting yep. to my customers. And I've said yeah. something to my local post office here in Massachusetts and uh, you know, everything is slowed down there. The stamps that I've ordered um, online for the US Postal Service never have arrived. The, the materials, the priority mail, envelopes that sort of stuff everything has had slowed down considerably but i've got a wonderful post office that i work with mm. but uh, once the new book is on amazon then um and I'm, I'm i'm having it reprinted in michigan now with one of my with one of the book printers so it will go to um publisher shipping and storage and then they will do all my fulfillment and i won't be packing up books out of my dining room or office um one one yeah. thing I want to uh, oh uh, one thing I want to just touch on and uh, we've got a few minutes here. One thing I want to touch on um, is kind of show you the evolution of how um, Bello the Cello has now created you know about four different um, avenues of income for me. Uh, so Bello is still selling. Um, for me personally, I set aside a two year window for each book uh, to maximize sales before I put out the next book. Uh, so Bello the Cello is coming up on that. Uh, but um, as my community was getting bigger, I remember uh, once I did a virtual visit and as I, as I was walking out, I had a, this, was, this was a school north of Oklahoma City, two hours away. Um, and I had done this presentation. I thought I had, man, uh, hit it out of the park. Um, 
you know, and I'm, I'm leaving the library and the librarian stopped me and asked me if I was open to feedback. And I said, sure. Um, and so she told me that my, you know, I was a brand new presenting author and she said, hey, I, I love your presentations. I love your books, um, but I still feel like something's missing. Um, and, you know, it was bittersweet. I love that she was giving me feedback, but also as a, as a new author, you know, I also was like, man, I felt like I was giving it my everything. I still need to crank out something. And so, um, you know, but I am so thankful that she did that. Um, so here I am, I'm, I'm driving back home, um, two hour drive, just chewing on, man, what else could I, like, do I pull a bunny out of a hat? Do I like, do I do magic tricks? What, what am I supposed to do? And right underneath my nose was, was this, you know, the fact that I've been a songwriter and a singer all my life. Um, and it just didn't dawn on me that I could, uh, incorporate my songs into my books. And so then, um, fast forward COVID hits. Um, all my virtual, you know, traveling gigs stopped because I, you know, I want to say in a matter of about six months, I'd gone, you know, I had about 60 schools that I had traveled to. So I had a very busy traveling schedule, but COVID kind of paused all that. And so again, kind of like Bella was created, life put me in another uncomfortable situation where all my travel seized and I had to make something of it. So um, over the three months, I was just cooped up at home. I started writing songs. So fast forward again, here's what has happened. Um, I've, I've put, uh, released a new music album uh, that goes along with my books now. Um, it's a social emotional learning focused music album. Um, and so I've got my books, I've got my music that goes along with my books. Um, along with that, I started connecting with many independent authors online. And they realized that a big focus of what I do is in the schools. And they said, hey, Dennis, would you create some doors for us into schools? And so now I also represent authors. Um, I go back to schools where I've done visits and I say, hey, you know what? This year, instead of considering me, I would love for you to consider one of my authors. And so what these authors who I represent do is they give me a percentage of the sales that they get from their visits. Meanwhile, while I'm creating new opportunities in new schools. So I've got the books that I write, the music that I do, I represent authors and out of the blue, a principal who was um, featured on so many news shows nationally, his story is amazing. He saw that I was doing all this writing and traveling and he reached out to me and he was just like, hey man, I wanna write a book. Would you consider ghostwriting it for me? So I was like, yeah, sure. And so I'm currently also ghostwriting this educator's book. Um, all that to say, uh, keep your eyes open for infinite possibilities. Always see an opportunity. Um, you know, always look for opportunities and, and um, they're always there. So that's where I am right now. My music, um, I'm in, in talks with music educators nationally about using my songs for um, like theater type productions. So I just allow things to kind of branch out. Um, so I, I don't, you know, pigeonhole myself into I'm just a writer. I kind of look at all the tools that I have in my toolbox and I kind of leverage all of them into uh, multiplication, all right? Um, so yeah, that's kind of, go ahead, Gail. Yeah, Dennis, uh, of all the strategies that you described, which one has, has led to the biggest return on investment? Follow-ups. Mm-hmm literally following up with somebody. My superintendent, uh, I had a superintendent, superintendent in Illinois. I don't know the guy, added him on Facebook as a stranger. He accepted my friend request. I messaged him and I say, hey, thank you so much for your Facebook ad. I love connecting with educators. I do that every day. Every day I connect with 10 to 15 educators, just adding them on Facebook. I'll message them and say, thank you so much for the ad. I love connecting with educators. If they respond to that message, yes. I just wanted to say I, I have to leave to do a presentation at 12, but thank you so much. It was very, very uh, illuminating. Excellent. Thank, thank I'll you. be in touch. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll just, I'll wrap up with this, okay? Uh, and I've got another presentation too. Yeah, so I, you know, this superintendent out of Illinois, I would check with him once a month um, for about a year. And at the end of the year, he just out of, out of the blue messaged me and said, uh, hey, you know what? I want 2,000 copies of Bello the Cello. 
one for every child in my district. Um, so I would say following up with people by email, text, social media, that has been my uh, biggest, you know, like mo you know, most winning strategy, but it doesn't seem like this amazing thing. It seems like something very simple and basic, uh, but I feel like that's sales. what it's, yeah, I feel like sales. Yeah. At the end of the day. Right. Um, so, all right. On that note, um, I've got to head on out. Uh, my friends, I hope you uh, enjoyed my, you know, what I've shared. Uh, please connect with me by email and my uh, social media uh, credentials. And uh, thank you so much, Eddie and family, uh, IPNE family, for having me. This is my first uh, author speaking gig ever. Dennis, this was fantastic. Sorry, I'm, I'm filling in for Eddie right now. I'm on the board of IFNI. He's on the other meeting. Um, I was here with my video off the entire presentation. I just sent you a message. This was, uh, you would never know it was your first. This was outstanding. It was full of energy. Um, it was inspirational. I myself am a teacher and an artist. So, yep, no. Nope. So I was just, even for a feel good, just, ah, uh, this is, Fantastic. As, and you you had tangible takeaways for us, things that, that we could take and do something with. So I love that you just ended with, this is my first time ever doing this, because I was blown away. Um, um, that yeah, was I, terrific, I, Dennis. Thank you so much. Like this, yeah. And this, I feel like this is yet another risk I'm taking. And I'm going to use this towards my credibility for the future. Hey, guess please, what? I just spoke at IPNE. You know what? Please do. And IPNE, you have our endorsement. Yes. That was, I just am so, again, I have heard so many people speak. And that was truly, truly terrific. Like I said, I was engaged the entire time, though my video was off. Um, I, I just, it was fantastic. Um, and if it's okay with you, I'm sorry if I missed this. If it's possible, just make sure um, you share your contact information if, if you're comfortable with that, because yeah, um, yeah absolutely. This was, I would, yeah, this was I would love to connect with you. Can I get your contact stuff from Eddie? Is that okay? Um, absolutely. By all means. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I can either send it to you directly or you can get it through Eddie. He has it all. Um, and yeah. if he thinks he doesn't, I'll take care of it. Don't worry. Uh, I have it, Michelle. Um, yeah, thank okay. you, Dennis. Cool. Thank you, Dennis, for, for doing that. Um, you, sorry, you Eddie, I was filling me. in because I know right. you're on the yeah. other call. No, I just wanted to say thank you to Dennis. I am on the other call. <laughs> Eddie, can you mute the other meeting? Because they can hear you. Is the screen share running? Oh. Yeah, Oops. they can hear you. Sorry, I've got two machines running. Yeah, I no can... problem. That's um, but yes, especially because you're an educator, I would love to yes. connect with you. And uh, let By me help out. Yeah. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for sharing your heart. I really appreciate your story. Um, and please feel free to, free to reach out to me. I would love to help you in any way I can. But thank you for sharing your life story. I really appreciated it. Absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. You do have an incredible life story. Bye, right. guys. Bye, Dennis. Bye, Andrew.